1999. Our featured speaker today is Dr. Frank Thompson. Sir, please go ahead. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CEDAR webinar series, Underwater Sound in Relation to Dredging. Uh, my name is Frank Thompson. I work at DHI in uh, Denmark, and I will guide you through this presentation. Now, first of all, um, this, what I'm going to talk about today, is really based on a, on a working group effort. In 2010, CEDAR convened an expert group on underwater sound, which published a paper in 2011 called Underwater Sound in Relation to Dredging. And uh, many of the things I want to talk uh, to you about today are mentioned in that uh, excellent uh, background paper. In my presentation, I will talk about sound and marine life. I will also, also review the effects of sound on marine life, what we know about it. I will then uh, mention mitigation measures, how can we reduce sound-related impacts, then review what has been uh, done in policy with regards to underwater sound, and finally, I will draw some conclusions based on what I said before. Now, dredging will appear throughout the presentation. I think it's better to include it in all these parts than instead of having a, it as a separate part. So dredging will be mentioned throughout. Now, let's first uh, explore sound a little bit. Sound is a traveling wave, and it can be defined by an acoustic pressure uh, in decibel, and this is 20 log uh, P divided by P0. Now, P0, that is really quite important. That is the reference pressure. And uh, it has to be noted, and it's really quite um, important if you want to compare it into air values, that underwater reference pressure is 1 micropascal, whereas in air, it's 20 micropascal. So it's actually very difficult to compare uh, decibel levels that are obtained or given for underwater to in air values. The second um, parameter variable that will appear throughout my presentation today is hertz or kilohertz, and this is just the number of cycles of the sound wave per second, and it's usually also described as the pitch of the signal. So we will come across decibel and hertz or kilohertz a lot in my presentation. Now let's start with this famous guy, Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau published a movie in 1952 called Le Monde du Silence, and if you translate this, it means the silent planet, and he was really clearly referring to the oceans. And of course, that was a huge misconception by even that famous guy. Because we know that sound, uh, that the oceans are very, very noisy. And the reason is that water is just an ideal medium for sound. Sound is more than four times faster underwater compared to air, and there's much less attenuation. And as a consequence, many marine life have uh, evolved in, in transmitting and receiving sound, and they're quite noisy, as we will hear in a second. I want to play back three sounds to you. Um, the first is from a killer whale in British Columbia. And I hope you can hear that uh, very well. This is a call killer whales use to communicate with one another over very, very large distances underwater. Um, about 25 to 30 kilometers uh, these sounds can carry. The second sound is a little bit more quieter. Very short, so I'm going to repeat that. That's a damsel fish, and it's a grunting sound that this fish uses for territorial display. The third sound is this. It sounds rather strange, but it contributes a lot to the background values in tropical waters, for example. And this is the sound of snapping shrimp. So marine life is noisy and has a lot of sounds. They use these sounds for a variety of purposes, for communication, for eavesdropping, listening on communication or other sounds to their own benefit, for foraging, for navigation, and for stunning prey. So a variety of purposes uh, for which sound is used. Now, man-made sound can interfere with this function. If we have a sound source here in the center, for example, sound can be detected by marine life over, in some cases, very, very large distances. Closer to the source, sound can mask communication signals or echolocation cords as signals of biological importance. Then even closer to the source, sound can lead to behavioral reaction, very subtle movements of the head or tails to outright avoidance of an area that is ensonified. And then very close to the sound source, sound can lead to hearing loss, either temporarily or permanently, or injury. And at very, very high received levels, sound can actually kill the receiver. 
If you want to investigate in sound impacts, we have to understand the hearing of the receivers of marine life. And this is shown here. Shown here is a marine mammal um, hearing course, or several marine mammal hearing course, for bottlenose dolphins, for harbor porpoises, and for killer whales and others. And what you can see here is on the x-axis, the frequency in kilohertz, the pitch, and on the y-axis, decibels. And as lower it gets, as more sensitive the marine life is, and for example, in this case, um, the harbor porpoise, at the green line here, you can see that it has a very high, high bandwidth of hearing from about 250 hertz to over or almost 200 kilohertz, and it's most sensitive in these ultrasonic or high frequencies at around 100 kilohertz. And that is so because porpoises produce echolocation clicks to navigate, and um, they are very, very high in frequency. Now, if you compare that to our hearing range, this is the hearing range of humans. It goes from 20 hertz to uh, 20 kilohertz. And this is, of course, a very restricted hearing range compared to marine mammals. So marine mammals here at these higher frequencies much better than we are, and they have a much, much higher bandwidth. Now, let's look at fish hearing. A fish hearing is quite complex. Fish can detect the particle motion uh, component of the sound waves. This is just the movements the velocity of the particles. And they can also detect the pressure. And it depends very much on the taxa that is involved. Flatfish, for example, here on the bottom, they can only detect the particle motion and they are relatively poor uh, sensitive to sound. Whereas herring is very, very sensitive to sound and can detect pressure. Shown here are audiograms from uh, several fish uh, uh, species. And if you, the first thing you see here is that this axis goes only to 1 kilohertz and not to 100 kilohertz, telling you that the bandwidth of the hearing is much restricted in fish. In fish, in fact, fish don't hear very well above 1 kilohertz. They, ho they hear only uh, below 1 kilohertz, most of the fish anyways. But if you see, for example, here in cod, cod has a fairly good uh, sensitivity at these lower frequencies. So compared to marine mammals, fish here at lower frequencies, and their bandwidth overall is restricted. But at these lower frequencies, some of them have a fairly good sensitivity. Now, marine sound sources are manifold. They can be biologically or they can be man-made. And uh, some of the sound sources are shown here. You can see here, for example, humpback whale uh, calls. They are a little bit below 150 um, dB, again, here on the uh, y-axis is decibel, on the x-axis is the frequency, the, the different frequencies of the signals. And you can see, for example, that seismic air gun arrays are right here uh, of the scale almost, uh, well above 200 uh, decibel, and mainly in the lower frequencies, and ten, extending to about 10 kilohertz. So there are a variety of sound sources in the marine environment. The marine environment, as I said before, is quite noisy, and it's comprised of biological and anthropogenic sounds. Seismic surveys, for example, are used for geophysical exploration by the oil and gas industry and by, for research purposes. And they can be as loud as 256 dB at the source. This is, of course, calculated from uh, far field measurements. Most of the frequency of seismic surveys is low, below 1 kilohertz. Then we have offshore wind. Offshore wind farm construction uh, goes along with impact pile driving, which can be as loud as seismic service. And I want to play back another signal for you here. This is um, a pile driving event we recorded uh, for the FINO-1 uh, research platform that was impact pile driven. Quite loud sounds as well. They can be as high as 228 decibel um, relative to one micropascal um, peak or 257 decibel relative to one micropascal peak to peak. This is just a different uh, variable or different, uh, different unit. What, what can be said is that pile driving can range very, very far. Then you have military activities. Um, there can be uh, sonar activities from low, frequen low frequency sonar to mid frequency and high frequency sonar. And the sound pressure levels at the source can be in excess of 220 decibel as well. There's also shipping. And broadly, we can divide shipping into three classes. Um, 
there is um, there are small leisure crafts and boats. I have to bear with you guys because I got a really interesting question here from one of the participants, and uh, he asked that how come that fish have such an improved hearing in relation to humans? Well, I don't know if the hearing is improved to humans. What you have to consider here is that the, the decibel values can't be compared from air to underwater. So basically what, what we can say is that fish has a good hearing at the low frequencies, but at the higher frequencies it's rather poor. And in fact, above one kilohertz, fish hearing is, is poorer than for humans. But keep, uh, keep on uh, this, this question, guys. It's, it's really interesting to see what you come up with here. Now, I was at shipping. Um, there are basically three types of, of vessels, small leisure crafts, medium-sized ships, and large vessels. And we can summarize that from the, from the smaller to the larger vessels, the sound pressure level basically increases and the frequency decreases. So in a very large vessel like that cruise ship below, we have sound pressure levels at the source between 180 and 190 decibel, and they are below 200 hertz, so very, very low in, in frequency. And then there's, of course, dredging. Dredging can be defined as excavation of sediment from a sea, river, or lake bed, and the handling and transport of the excavated sediments and soils to a placement site elsewhere. And there are many different activities comprising dredging. Construction of maintenance ports or waterways, reclamation of new land, flood and storm protection and erosion control, extraction of mineral resources from underwater deposits, environmental remediation of contaminated sediments. So there are a lot of activities that, that dredging is composed of. Dredger types and noisy activities, there are four basic types of dredgers, cutter suction dredgers, trailing suction hopper dredgers, grab dredgers, and backhoe dredgers. And there are three activities where sound can be emitted. Excavation, dredging vessel during transport, and dredging material placement. And these are illustrations from the background document showing um, the, the sound sources of different dredgers. And if you refer to this one here, this is a grab dredger, and you can see that there might be sound from digging here from this, from this grab. There might be also sound from the engine or from the propeller, uh, just basically uh, from the workboard or tuck. So a fairly limited amount of sound sources for, for this grab dredger. But this is a trailing suction hopper dredger. This is, for example, used in aggregate ex extraction. And this is a drag head, and it basically sucks the gravel into this, into this uh, larger, larger ship. There can be sound from the drag head. There can also be sound from the pump and pipe, thruster sound, inboard pump sound, and, of course, the propeller sound. And, in fact, this is the main sound source. The propeller is really contributing to these to these sound levels from a dredger. And this is the reason why dredgers can be really compared to medium-sized ships when it comes to sound emissions. And this is shown here. This is uh, also um, part of a new investigation that De Jong uh, et al. did for the um, uh, Port of Rotterdam's construction with their measurements of six uh, trailing suction hopper dredgers. Shown here is, again, the, the frequency, the pitch of, this, of, of the different uh, activities, and then the source sound pressure level. And you can see here, this is a spectrum from dredging um, in green here. And you can see that there's a peak here at below uh, 63 hertz, at least uh, in the lower frequencies, where the dredging is quite loud. And then it decreases over the frequency range. So basically, uh, dredgers have relatively high source levels at the lower frequencies. And then the sound energy decreases when the frequency gets higher. There are exceptions from the rule. Uh, when, for example, more harder uh, sediment is, is dredged, then the sound uh, can be higher at the higher frequencies. But in general, dredgers really compare to medium-sized ship when it comes to sound emissions. Low frequency emissions and uh, sound source levels can be between 180 and 190 decibels. Now, let's look, talk a little bit about the impacts of the underwater sounds on marine life. And I have some examples for you. Um, this is a detection of pile driving from a, from a modeling exercise we did back in 2006. And what you can see here, again, is the frequency on the, on the x-axis and the uh, sound pressure level on the y-axis. And what uh, is given in the green uh, parts are the sound spectra at 1 meter and at 80 kilometer, both calculated. And here, in the, in the lower panel of the graph, you can see, again, the audiogram of a harbor porpoise, a wide bandwidth of hearing, very good, frequency, very good at the higher frequencies, and then the herring, which has a restricted bandwidth 
uh, but is fairly good at the lower frequencies. And this here is the ambient sound, uh, fairly broadband ambient sound in the lower frequencies. And what can be deciphered from that graph is that the sound pressure levels that, that are um, at 80 kilometer distance from an impact pile driver are far ahead a bit, uh, above the ambient noise, and they're also above the hearing curve for the harbor porpoise and for the herring. So we can deduct from that that a herring and porpoises are able, under these conditions here, this is for the North Sea, to detect pile driving at a distance of about um, at least 80 kilometers from the source. Now, detection of dredging sound. Um, this is from an investigation we did for, for, for another um, construction uh, project. This is uh, the, the detection distance from a trailing suction Hubbard dredger as calculated by us. And it's a little bit different than the previous graph. You can see frequency again on the, on the x-axis and detection distance on the y-axis. But given here is the frequency-dependent hearing range. And it basically says that, this graph says that, um, the sounds at one kilohertz can be detected about at a distance of about 17 kilometers from a dredger. So um, a dredger can be detected by harbor porpoise at fairly large distances, but not as uh, large distances as, as, for example, pile driving. Uh, there's a question here: um, Is aggregate extraction dredging louder than navigation dredging? Um, I would say that it depends on the, on the material that is dredged. Uh, we don't have very good investigations from navigation dredging. In fact, the only really good um, measurements we have so far are from, uh, from trailing suction hopper dredgers and cutter suction dredgers. Um, and for more detailed information, it's probably good to, to look up the, um, the new paper that will come out by VODA, which is a guideline document on underwater sound, where we go in much more detail on these uh, different sound levels. But overall, we can say that Aggregate extraction um, from a trailing suction hubber dredger is, is uh, between 180 and uh, 190 uh, decibel at the source. Now, what about behavior response? We know that marine life uh, can pick up sounds at very large distances, but what about response? And of course, this is very difficult to assess. Uh, it depends on many variables. There's a source um, that can have different properties, duration, can be transient or continuous. There's a channel, uh, depending on environmental conditions, sound can range far or not so far. And then, of course, there's also all the variables that act on the receivers. Um, and this makes uh, assessing or predicting behavior response particularly challenging. Now, we have some studies. Uh, this is a very interesting investigation back in 96 from Angers et al. And what they looked at was response of fish to seismic surveys. Um, what they did is they were catching fish uh, before, during, and after seismic surveys. And they uh, did that at the center of the survey activity and at different distances shown here. And you can see here that um, before, um, the, the catches before were equally roughly the same. There's no statistical significance here. Um, but then if you compare before to during and after, there's a sharp decrease in catches. And the decrease is notable at distances of 80 nautical miles. In fact, uh, there was a significant decline in herring catch rate during and after seismic exposure. And it took uh, five days to recover. And um, there, there were also vertical movements of, in, in some cases. So basically, in some investigations, there are um, there are points to make that fish can pick up the seismic uh, service sounds over very large distances. What about uh, dredging? Now, we know very little about impacts from, from dredging on behavior. We know that gray and bullhead whales avoid areas of dredging activity, but some uh, don't avoid it. So the results are very equivocal here. Uh, we know from a recent investigation that harbor porpoises uh, left an area during sand uh, extraction and the reactions were relatively short term, however, and the spatial scale was about 600 meters from the dredger where this could be observed. So small scale and short term behavioral reactions are documented, but very, very, very little results overall. Now, the ultimate question we want to pose, of course, is what do all these behavioral reactions mean? Do they have any biological significance? Because what does it make if a porpoise just swims away from a sound source? And there's a model here. Um, this is called the Population Consequences of Acoustic Disturbance Model. And what it basically is that, is that it goes from the sound 
over different transfer functions all the way to population level consequences. And there are different transfer functions between these different factors. And in theory, a sound can affect, let's say, diving behavior of, of an individual. This can lead then to a change in feeding behavior. And this can then, if it's over a prolonged period of time, affect the reproduction of that individual. And then this, in theory, could lead to population level consequences. And you might see um, by all these question marks in these transfer functions that this model is, of course, very theoretical. But it's important, and it's going to be applied in the future. But so far, we have very, very little information about these transfer functions in the model. Now masking. Masking, as I said, is the obscurement of biological relevant sound um, by uh, the obscurement of biological relevant sound. And this masking potential of shipping sound is shown here. Shown here is the frequency range from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz. And what you can see in the upper panel is the, the vocalization frequencies of whales, fish, seals, sea lions, and tooth whales. And then the range of shipping sounds. We have learned, I think, in this web seminar that shipping sound goes from 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz, so in the lower frequencies. And you can see here that if there is an issue with mask masking, it will be for the larger weights and for the fish, which uh, communication signals or other signals are completely, or, in some, or at least in fish, completely masked by, by shipping sound. Uh, whereas for seals and uh, sea lions and tooth whales, the issue might be minor because many of their sounds, or sounds of many species, are, don't really uh, happen to be in the same range as shipping sound. Now, there are theoretical consequences of masking. Shown here is, uh, is in, in red, is the theoretical communication range for a blue whale of the uh, east coast of North America in low ambient noise conditions. And this is what the communication range looks like when there's a relatively high background noise. Now, sound is transmitted logarithmically, so every impact is quite profound. Now, the imp a really interesting question is whether the whales make use of these very, very large, large ranges in the first place. So if there is a, uh, a change in these ranges, is it really of any biological significance? Hearing loss and injury, um, yes. There's a temporary threshold shift. Temporary threshold shift is a temporary ele elevation of the hearing threshold. We experience this when we listen to very loud music, um, and after that we can't hear very well for, let's say, for an hour or so, and then hearing resumes back to normal. What has been found in these cases is that TTS is really depending on sound type, duration, and pressure. It's, it seems to be the overall dose of the sound that is really important when it comes to, to these impacts on the hearing. And this is shown here. Here on the x-axis is just time. This is a pie driving operation in the German North Sea. And this is a, on the, on the y-axis uh, is a decibel level. And shown here are sound exposure level. And sound exposure level can be viewed as an acoustic dose at the receiver. And you can see that this acoustic dose here at the receiver at, at the very first instance of that pie driving. Pie driving started at 450 and then stopped at 525. So it was about half an hour long, a little bit over half an hour long. And you can see here that uh, the sound pressure level at the start is really low, so the dose that the animals experience is, is, is low compared to other sounds. And then at, um, and this is at two kilometer distances, and then it increases to a level that actually after half an hour a level is reached, accumulated at the receiver, that can actually induce TGS. So if that animal uh, is not swimming away, and this is uh, done for harbor purpose, it would experience TGS even if one pulse would not be enough. So these cumulative exposures are really important to consider. There's another question here um, from one of you. Um, most of experiences done on marine mammal hearing threshold are made from few and often old specimen. How to be sure that we don't underestimate the impact? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thanks for that. Um, well, you can uh, underestimate the impact, and you are, of course, right. There are only very few um, audiograms. but. Progress is being made. Um, there are uh, now more studies looking at hearing. Um, for example, the um, audiogram from a porpoise is from a juvenile, so showing exceptionally good hearing. But of course, you're right. It's very difficult to, to extrapolate um, in, within one species because there's a lot of variation. And then it's also, of course, very difficult to extrapolate between different species based on, on these very limited data we have. So there are a lot of uncertainties. 
Now, mitigation, what can we do to reduce sound? There are a variety of mitigation measures. Uh, you can put um, actually sounds in the water to, change, to chase the animals out of an injury zone. Um, and this is done uh, in offshore wind farm construction. We call these devices pingers. They emit a very high frequency sound, which is quite annoying for seals and harbor porpoises and chases them away out of a range where they could get hurt. You can, of course, also time your investigations. They can be restricted to times where there's, for example, no spawning or no breeding. And this is, of course, very difficult of, uh, because some of the, the times that are interesting for marine life are also very interesting for offshore wind farm construction, for example. Then uh, monitoring of safety zones. Uh, you can put observers or acoustic devices listening for the uh, marine mammals out in the water in these, uh, to observe this 500 meter radius. In fact, this is done quite regularly during seismic investigations. You can do research, of course, like more audiograms, that, that helps. Um, you can design your equipment quite differently, and this is shown in this picture. This is basically what it is, is a, a sleeve, a pie sleeve around a pile driver, and the sound is really uh, reflected from this, uh, from this plastic f uh, sleeve, and it reduces the sound pressure levels from an offshore wind farm pile driver by about 10 decibels, so that, that is quite good. Now, if you uh, apply this uh, concept and put bubbles instead of uh, plastic foam around that, you create some kind of a bubble curtain, and it sounds really strange, but it, that's what, it happen, what happens at the moment. In Germany, there are, um, uh, it's, there are several projects where bubble curtains are put in the water around these pile drivers, and they seem to be very, very effective as well. Another uh, technology to um, reduce sound levels can be ramp up, soft start. This is used in the oil and gas industry and for pile driving. You can start very slow or very low in your sound pressure levels that are emitted to provide the animals with a chance to move away. And uh, whether this methodology works is actually unknown. So a variety of impacts, but really the message is that of course, it's not only sound. Um, shown here is, is basically a graphic from an, from an investigation uh, I and co-authors did in 2009 on the pressures that act on harbor porpoises. Um, and you can see really that uh, there are a lot of pressures uh, where harbor porpoises are uh, exposed to. From the upper left, we, we start with shipping, then there's fishing, then there is also in some areas predation by killer whales. Uh, you have contaminants acting on them. Then you got sound from offshore wind farm, from dredging. There's also, of course, uh, pressures on food abundance or lower food abundance. And then there's, in some areas, competition with other species, for example, bottlenose dolphins. So it's not only underwater sound that acts on them. It's really this kind of concert um, of different factors that act on, on receivers. And it's understanding this cocktail of different impacts that really makes for a really good and comprehensive impact assessment. Now, and finally, policy. Uh, up until, let's say, 20 years ago, the issue of underwater sound was, was an, pretty much an issue that was discussed in elite you know, expert circles. Um, and this has changed, of course, um, uh, most notably with the incidents, stranding incidents due to naval uh, exercises in, uh, in 2000 and, and follows where, where animals stranded concurrent to naval exercises. And uh, policy had, has picked that up. And in Europe, there's a Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Um, it was published in 2008, and the, uh, the directive aims at uh, restoring or maintaining good environmental status. And they do that along 11 descriptors. And one of them is underwater sound. And for underwater sound, uh, for this descriptor 11, as it's called by the MSFD, there are two indicators, and one is uh, tackling the chronic exposure to continuous low-frequency sound, and it addresses the issue of mas masking and potentially stress in marine mammals and fish. And uh, a task group where I'm also participating has defined um, this indicator and uh, gave guideline on how to monitor this indicator. And what it really does is, is that member states should monitor, and it's spelled out here, trends in the ambient noise level within octave bands that are representative for shipping, low frequency bands, 63 to 125 hertz, over one year, and measured as, uh, by observation stations and with the use of models. So modeling and measurement will go hand in hand here. But it, what is really important to note about this indicator is that, yes, there will be monitoring for underwater sound throughout all Europe, and this is thanks to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and I think it's a, it's a good progress overall because we know very little about the pressures and the introduction of underwater sound. 
Now I'm in my conclusions, um, the more general conclusions. Underwater sound is important for marine life. I think we have learned that uh, man-made underwater sound can impact marine life in various ways and over various spatial scales. Um, a lot of gaps still exist on impacts of underwater sound on marine life. And mitigation measures are being developed and policy has picked up on the issue uh, already, as we have seen with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Now a little bit more specific to dredging. Dredging comes with lower sound pressure levels compared to other activities, for example, pile driving or seismic surveys. Uh, behavioral impacts and masking are possible. TTS might be considered when animals are very, very close to a dredger for a long time. Injuries, however, are, are unlikely because the sound pressure levels are not high enough to uh, injure marine life. And uh, it's really important to do more studies on dredging sounds. There is some progress there with, the, with these recent studies, but there can be more on other types of dredges. And of course, also, there need to be more studies on effects on marine life. And with that, I'm, uh, I'm done with my presentation. And um, thanks, everyone, for, for the attention. And I, of course, I want to thank the, the, the people that have been involved in these um, various groups. As I said, there was a CEDA expert group on underwater sound, and there is now a VODA expert group on underwater sound. And I want to really like a heartful thanks to everyone that, uh, who was involved in these, in these two groups and continues to being involved. And watch out for the paper that will be published, I think, in, in June, and it's called the VODA guidance document on underwater sound. Thanks for your attention, and I will take questions now. Okay, there are now questions coming in. There were questions actually coming in from the, from the audience during the presentation. I addressed some of them. Um, let's see. There's one. Hello. Are turtles also affected by noise? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, we, what we know is that, that turtles, like loggerhead turtles, have hearing. Um, they are not so, um, so sensitive um, compared to, let's say, um, some fish species or some marine mammal species, but in fact they have, they have hearing. Um, it's quite completely unknown for what they use these, uh, this hearing capability, but um, uh, in the investigations um, point to the direction that, that, they are, um, that they are sensitive to underwater sound. For what, uh, why they are sensitive is, is unknown. There's a question, please can I get a copy of the presentation? Well, this presentation is apparently filmed and will be posted for everyone to see on the on the CEDA web page. Um, so that's, there you go. Um, yeah, how, there's another one. So there are questions here from uh, how sensitive are the small sea animals, for example, plankton? Well, um, we don't know really um, because they don't seem to have organs that can receive sound. But I understand your question insofar as of course, sound is a pressure um, and can, of course, impact marine life in many ways. And of, it's, it's thinkable that plankton uh, close to a pile driver or so, or so will be, of course, impacted, can drift away, and the sheer pressure can perhaps destroy parts of that. But other than that, we don't know very much about uh, the impacts on, for example, invertebrates um, or even um, plankton. There's a question about the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Once we have one year monitoring of sound, what do you think should be the next steps? Well, first of all, my, my first point to make is that we should have that one year of monitoring or two years of monitoring. That is really important. And this hasn't, hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, the, the task group has made uh, now concrete, concrete suggestions for how to, do, how to monitor ambient sound and also model ambient sound. And I think the most important bit for me is uh, in this whole Marine Strategy Framework Directive is to, to document and to register sound. We don't know enough about the effects. We know that it might be an important environmental issue, or we know that it is an important environmental issue, but we understand the effect not well enough to manage it as of yet. I think it's really important that we have some monitoring. That's, that's the first part of my answer. And the second part of my answer is then that we could, we could think of a threshold values that can be imposed, targets, to reduce underwater sound. But that is, of course, then when we know the impacts and when we know the pressures. Yeah, there's, uh, there's an excellent question from another panelist or from another contributor. Um, 
and the questions are coming in, so I, I have a hard time listening, uh, reading this. Can you tell a word about underwater noise related to foundation drilling? Yes, I can. Um, drilling is, is quieter than, 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 uh, than uh, dredging in most cases. It depends uh, very much on the drill ship that is used um, and the thrusters that are used in this drill ship, but we can say that, that drilling is, is more or less quieter than compared to, for example, trailing suction harbor dredges. Um, yes, another question is, do you have any data on sound levels from backhoe dredgers? As far as I uh, know, there's only one study, um, but uh, you have to also, I would like to refer you also to this uh, VODA uh, uh, paper. Is there any analysis on difference of noise impacts in cold and more warm waters like the tropics? I can see that we have really experts in the in the audience today. As far as I know, there isn't. I mean, you you would expect that sound transmission is a little bit different between warm and cold waters. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, there is no investigation. There is, however, uh, another issue that has to do with the um, the particles that are dissolved in water, and this is the impact on cli of climate change on sound transmission. Uh, there is a theory that ocean acidification leads to a uh, uh, suspension of what we call more acoustic particles in the water column, and henceforth uh, the sound transmission is much better at certain frequencies, which will uh, lead to, amb to higher ambient noise levels in the future compared to uh, what we have now. And this is, of course, a scenario that, that is quite, quite frightening. It's very theoretical, of course, uh, but uh, this is how climate change could affect, um, could affect sound. Yes, I have to pick the questions. Um, yeah, are bubble curtains effective in open water around offshore wind farm piles? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it depends. Um, the, the studies in Germany have shown that it really depends on how deep it is and, and on the tide and the current. It seems to be best at slack tide when there's no really movement, but as soon as the tide picks up and there's a very strong current, the air bubbles are uh, redistributed and this, the bubble curtain is not as effective as it would be at other uh, situations. Yes, uh, there's... Um, Frank, how well can the M weighting be used to judge the effect of sound on mammals? Does there also exist a similar weighting for fish? Yeah, this is a specialist question. Um, M weighting is basically a weighting of, of the impact of the sound, depending on the theory that uh, an equal weighting criterion is applied at the opposite ends of the hearing. In other words, the reaction will flatten out as the animals get very less sensitive or uh, at the lower end of the frequencies and at the higher end of the frequencies. And this M weighting leading to different exposure levels than it would be based on the audiogram is, has been applied actually already in a study by Southall. There's an American research group that has uh, put forward um, exposure criteria for marine mammals, and they have used that M weighting. And um, the, this work is published in 2007, I think it was, and is currently under review and has made quite a, quite a huge impact on the uh, scientific community. Not so much on regulators, but uh, the threshold values that are uh, proposed by Southall are being applied by scientists in a number of studies. And the re revision of these uh, impact value of these exposure criteria will be out uh, soon. For fish, um, I'm not sure if, if the same criteria applies. What we have so far is a dual criterion, one based on, on peak sound pressure level and the other one on the sound exposure level. And uh, as far as I know, this is applied in, uh, in US regulation at the moment. Okay, what levels and frequencies are measured during storms and wave motions? Yes, uh, sound is, of course, depending on, on the uh, movement of the water particles. I can't give you details here, but I know that, of course, during storms and wave motions, sound is much, much higher uh, than during non-storm uh, non events. But, it, of course, it's also very difficult to measure because you have to deploy the hydrophone at a, at a water depth uh, to actually measure the movements of the, of the particles. What I can chip in is maybe an anecdote from, from my PhD um, that whenever there was, for example, rain or, or you know, just a chop on the, on the water and I had my hydrophone down to record, record kilowatt sounds in that case, it was a, a, actually almost impossible to get good recordings unless you lowered the hydrophone to a water depth of at least 50 meters. 
um, and it was quite a quite a high frequency uh, noise, a little bit not unlike snapping shrimp. Qu quite annoying actually on the recordings. Okay, we have. Um, how far does the sound carry in the case of explosion dredging? Yes, I think this is more or less a, a question that is not so much concerning dredging, but ex explosions also in, in general. Um, yes, explosions are, uh, are allowed. Um, they are um, well, of course, well in excess of 200 uh, decibel. They are a little bit different from as, as a sound characteristics because they are, the rise time is very, very high. Um, the rise time being the, the time from from the instant to the full exposure of the sound, because the sound is very, very short. Um, so it's, it, has a, it produces a sound wave that is transmitted a little bit different than a usual sound wave. But we can assume that the, the, the ranges over which explosions can be heard are, are in excess of a course of dredging. Yes. There's uh, one question on the long-term effects. Do we know what long-term effects are on fish or mammals, for instance, in ports where continuous dredging is done? Well, not really. Um, as we have seen in this, or uh, we have seen in the seminar, dredging is, is a continuous sound. It's more or less a sound that can be compared to shipping. And we don't have much investigations on, on dredging per se, but except the study that I mentioned earlier, uh, that was done on, on gray whales, where, where it was found that construction um, was uh, was leading to a almost complete avoidance of the area by by gray whales. But that construction involved many different activities, not only dredging. Um, what we know is that that shipping can have an effect. Um, it seems that that harbor porpoises um, have in some areas a, a quite negative correlation in their movements to shipping lanes. They seem to to avoid areas of, of very high shipping. Perhaps also for uh, because there is sound exposure there. In other areas, this, this trend is not so clear, but we found it in one. And um, so it seems that that um, if the sound level is continuous and if it, it reaches a certain threshold, that there might be uh, some impact there, uh, also of a long-term nature. But for this, we would have to monitor much better or over a much longer time period. Yes. There's one uh, one question about this fish um, fish study. Um, there's a like quite a provocative fish uh, uh, question on fishes. Why are we caring about fish when we used to eat them? Um, well, I think this is this is an excellent excellent question. Of course, I think we we have to point out why we're interested in fish. Um, the, the reasons for studying sound and fish and marine mammals are maybe a little bit different. In marine mammals, there's a conservation aspect, of course. Um, because most of them are, or all of them, are marine mammals are protected uh, in Europe by the Marine Habitats Directive. Um, for fish, it's, it's a little different story. There is, of course, protected fish as well, but um, there's also an, another issue. Um, if we imagine that we, uh, that we chase fish out of important habitat, for example, uh, for example, during a pie driving event, for example, at a spawning area, then we have perhaps also um, impacts on recruitment and biological parameters. So that's why we are interested in fish. And in fact, in some areas, the, the problem on, of sound and fish is far more, is viewed far more important than the impact on marine mammals. And this is precisely in areas where fishermen fear reduced catches. Again, of course, this is highly speculative because we don't really know the, the impacts or the long-term impacts of underwater sound on fish. But this is the reason why we, why we are interested in that uh, a topic. Yes, you men uh, okay there. Sorry, uh, the, you mentioned the ship propeller has a high noise output. Is there any data on alternative propulsion measures, e.g., uh, voids, Snyder, or jets? Yes, there is. Um, there was a workshop uh, last year in, in London about uh, about that um, engineering techniques, and and I was about the only biologist there, and it was fascinating to see what what. Uh, uh, what uh, progress has been made. Uh, you mentioned jets, but the, the, what is really the, the issue seems to be is redesigning the propeller to make it uh, the cavitation, uh, because it's really the sound is caused by the cavitation to uh, get rid of that cavitation. So there are um, groups working on this, and I think this is also the key to understanding, understanding or reducing the impact of, of a sound from shipping, is these engineering technologies.
Yeah, excellent other question. Are there any studies on diving seabirds in underwater noise? No, there isn't any study. Um, but there's one, um, one friend of mine who is uh, investigating this at the moment. Um, he has uh, two cormorants um, in a cage in a facility uh, in Denmark, and he is investigating the underwater hearing in these cormorants. And uh, he has now produced underwater audiograms of these, uh, of these two uh, specimens. And it's a, it's a fascinating study because it's really important to know how well uh, uh, birds can hear. As you might recall, many, some birds dive you know, almost 100 meters down um, for food, and uh, they're quite agile underwater. So it ma would make sense for them to go by acoustical cues as well. If this is the case, then of course sound, anthropogenic sound, can affect can affect uh, these birds um, as well as marine mammals and fish. And this study um, that is uh, undertaken on cormorants right now will will change our outlook quite a bit. So it's, there's no studies as of yet, but there's one coming. What strategy, there's another one, what strategy would you recommend in monitoring the construction of offshore wind farms? Yes, I think uh, it should be a combination of acoustics, uh, listening in uh, to the uh, activities of, of uh, the marine mammals, for example, porpoises. You can do that using porpoise acoustic detectors. Uh, you can place them inside the offshore wind farm and then at several distances out. And this should be done before, during, and after. We call that uh, before, during, and after control impact a design, it's called a backy design as well. And uh, then I would also recommend to do visual, uh, visual surveys, area surveys before, during, and after. Area surveys are a little bit difficult in this case because it's only a snapshot um, and a, a short-term redistribution of the animals is then ultimately difficult to detect, but it could help to identify larger scale uh, patterns. So a combination of acoustics and, and visual surveys should do it. Again, I, you're great, guys. I mean, these questions are just coming pouring in here. Um, yeah. Hi, you mentioned a 10 dB attenuation within the inclusion of a plastic sleeve when pie driving. What is the approximate additional contribution of the bubble curtain? Yeah, well, that was maybe a misunderstanding. Um, that would actually be the best method to do a bubble curtain around the pie sleeve. Uh, no, it's, it hasn't been done yet. I mean, as far as I know, there was only that uh, pie sleeve or the uh, bubble curtain, and both seem to function pretty much in the same, uh, with the same efficiency, about 10 decibels. What has to be noted here is that it's depending on, on currents, and it's uh, also, um, yeah, it's depending very much on, on, uh, on the currents and on frequencies. Um, at, as higher the frequencies get, it's better, actually, the attenuation of, of the um, uh, sound is. And this is, of course, good when it comes to marine mammals, which have a better uh, hearing sensitivity at these higher frequencies. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's good. Um, I think that's all the questions for now. Um, again, it, it was a pleasure to, to host this um, to the seminar series. I, I hope we uh, we uh, we all learned, or you all learned a lot. I certainly enjoyed it. And with that, I will uh, give back at the convener. Thank you very much for your attention, and have a good day.